Today on Muscle Car, learn how to take the concept of a Muncie four-speed transmission and improve it with re-engineered and modernized parts that make it way stronger and more durable. Then, how to remove good glass without killing it and keeping the heat out of your ride. Hey, good to see you with us. We're in the midst of building a project that's modeled after one of the most iconic muscle cars that's ever graced the highways and byways of America, the 69 ZL1 427 Copa Camaro. We knew we wanted a Muncie-style four-speed, and you can source your parts and the case out to many different companies. But if we were going to take this car as far as we wanted to, we knew we wanted to get our hands on the best parts possible. So that's where Phil Hudson comes in. He's out of Syracuse, New York, with a company called Auto Gear. They manufacture some of the smoothest and toughest Muncie four-speed style transmissions available. That's right. About in the year 2000, customers had problems getting quality parts for their Muncie rebuilds. So Auto Gear started with a new case and then went through the rest of the transmission to what the parts we have today. Phil's gonna show us the ins and outs of their new four speeds, and while we're at it, we're gonna to get to see some of the ways they've improved on Muncie's original design. Here's a transmission that we offer from Auto Gear, and here's the original Muncie. Our box offers more ratios than the original Muncie with extra added features that gives us more strength and durability. Now I've been around a couple Muncie's in my time. Let's go see how one of yours goes together. You can see right from the beginning, Auto Gear case is a lot thicker versus a Muncie. And this will add to strength because on the Muncie case, they've had problems with the ears breaking off where you bolt up to the bell housing and with a counter shaft breaking in the front of the case. And I'm gonna show you something different about these two cases on the front. One of the problems with the Muncie case, after a period of time, this case would crack or this hole would become elongated right here and you'd have gear separation and have problems. And then with our case, we improved it by putting a steel plug and it took the force and spread it over a wider area. Now we're gonna start assembling our cluster, but when you get it from us, it's already one assembly. We have your third speed gear, your drive gear, it's already pressed on and start our assembly. These are caged bearings, not the full comp, so it makes assembly a lot easier. Now we can bring in our case and start installing our cluster. Now we're gonna install our counter shaft. It has a flat on the shaft, and it has to line up horizontal with the back of the case. If it's not lined up, you're not gonna get your mid plate in place. Now we're gonna install our reverse idler gear assembly. We'll set our reverse idler gear in, and we're ready to go on to our next step. As we've been saying, Auto Gear has done many things to improve their cases and their components over the stock units. Another one of them is this. The original mid plates are made out of aluminum and prone to cracking, as you can see there. Auto Gear's plates are made out of cast iron and therefore much stronger. Also, the drive gear bearings and the mid plate bearings are sealed units versus the stock original bearings, which are open rollers and prone to contamination and any kind of material that might build up in there inducing premature failure. Once Phil has pressed the first and second speed clusters onto the main shaft, he can do the same with the speedo gear. Phil's getting ready to install the main drive into the new transmission. But Phil, before you do, I know you guys offer two different options. Can you give us a brief explanation of what they might be between the two of them? This is more like the original Muncie. They used a shim where they would put it over and then the nut has to go this way because the oil would come through the input gear. So we have a wrench that's made to hold this nut so that you can tighten it. And with our input gear, you notice that it's a little longer. We got a longer pilot. This gives you more strength through here because now you're not rolling your spline right into the shaft. And then your seal will ride on the front and keep the oil from coming through the front retainer. Before we install our main drive, we have to put some grease on this bearing to keep these rollers in place. We have a cardboard sleeve that comes with its bearing as it's shipped to keep it contained. But once that sleeve comes off, the rollers can go every different direction. There we go. Bearings in place. Now we have a complete main shaft ready to be installed into the case. I'm gonna apply the RTV to our surface to help our gasket. Put the gasket on. In order to get this shaft to go into the case, I need to move this sleeve into the fourth speed position, which is drive and that'll clear our third speed step on the cluster. We're gonna install our main drive bearing, and we have a special tool that we use it to press it in. Some people gently massage it with a hammer, but that's not the correct way of doing it. Twenty foot-pounds of torque on the front retainer, 
and on the counter shaft bolt. So we'll do both of those at the same time. We're getting ready to set the side cover in, and I want to show you guys a couple of differences between Auto Gear's new one and the original. First of all, theirs was made out of steel, and the original one was, like I said, aluminum. The shift forks themselves, this is the stock design where the pads would hold the shift sleeve just out here on the ends. Auto Gear's new forks have a pad that goes completely around the whole 180 degrees. This means as the transmission ages, it'll keep it from rocking. The case also has a roller bearing inside, which means you will not get the roll in the egg-shaped hole that comes from years of service in the transmission, which can affect the shift. The side cover then goes onto the housing, being careful to make sure that the forks land correctly. Then we'll just install the vent on the top. Well, there you go. Thanks to the guys at Auto Gear and Phil, we're one step closer to getting our Copo on the street and being able to have a good time with it. Thanks, Phil. We really appreciate it. Well, thanks for having me. It's been a great honor, and enjoy your transmission. No problem. Good luck. Thank you. Coming up, we'll show you the tools you can use to save your factory glass when you remove it, plus how to prevent corrosion on raw metal easily and affordably. Hey guys, welcome back. Every day we're getting closer and closer to taking a ride in our big block with a four-speed Camaro. Now this black paint is starting to make this thing look pretty sinister, not to mention our wheels and tires. We put in a call to our buddies over at Coker Tire and they hooked us up big time. For the tires, we're rocking a set of these Firestone Wide Oval F7014s. These are true bi-supply tires like these cars would have come with back in the day and they maintain an appearance that's accurate to that as well. We've got those wrapped around one of the iconic pieces of the Copo look, these base steel wheels that I've sprayed body color. These 14 by seven wheels will eventually get a set of center caps from Classic Industries that will act like a little bit of jewelry for this old gal. With the outside of our Camaro well on its way, it's time to start making some motions to be able to put the interior in it. And one of those is being able to paint the top side of this dash because it's pretty sun faded. And to do that, I'm going to have to pull out this window. Now somebody's replaced the windshield some time back, so I'm going to try really hard not to screw it up. And so today, I'm going to show you a few tips and tricks to use just in case you need to try this at home. One of your options for removing glass is what I call a pull type window knife. Now you just hook this blade right under the edge and then just simply pull it across the glass. And then there's just the windshield knife that takes a disposable blade that you can replace really easily and it works really well whenever cutting along the bottom side of a dash. And then there's the big bad boy, the air knife or pneumatic knife. Now this thing will definitely get the job done, but it kind of requires a feel for cutting. And then there's the old school one that's referred to as the piano wire type. Now you run this through the glass and then you kind of saw it back and forth, kind of like an old two man saw. The first one I'm going to demonstrate is the pull knife with a little bit of glass cleaner. You may be wondering why in the world am I using glass cleaner? Well, on this dry rubber, I'm going to use a little bit of it for some lubrication because it helps in the cutting process. Now you just want to put the blade in as low as you can and then just kind of twist it. Now whenever you're pulling across here, I like to turn the blade, lean it back just a bit. What that does is that turns the blade edge up to get right along the edge of that glass because otherwise you're trying to chew through all that rubber. It's kind of difficult to do. Okay, the next thing we're going to use is the just standard old knife. And the beauty behind this thing is it's long and it has a lot of leverage to it. Now the next tool is the air knife. And all you would simply do is push this right through the sealer, push the button, and that thing will start doing its job. But I know my skill set with this thing, so I'm going to use the more primitive style tools. That way I've run less chance of kind of screwing stuff up because I don't have a real good feel for this thing. Next is the piano wire type. You gotta make you a hole for that piece of wire, and then you take this small piece of wire, push it back through if you can, and then feed that piece of wire into your pull handle. We're just about ready to start cutting. You don't want to be pulling up like that and trying to saw because this edge of the wire will dig into the bottom of the glass, bust it, chip it, scratch it, chew it up. Well, there you go. Removing glass isn't all that difficult when you have the proper tools. And so are you guys out there that are afraid of breaking glass, don't be too afraid, just pay attention. Unless it's already broken, then don't care if you break it or not, just get the job done. Still ahead, Mink gets out his hot plate and cooks up a side-by-side -side comparison to show you how to keep heat from ruining your summertime cruise. Plus a look at our Copo's clutch.
Hey guys, we keep chipping away at our old Camaro, getting it closer and closer to having it roadworthy. And today we're going to take care of an issue that'll make this thing a lot more comfortable while riding around in it. Now with our Copo, this thing doesn't have AC on it. So to make it as comfortable as we can, we're going to coat the floor with some lizard skin thermal coating. What that means is it's going to reduce the heat transfer, 25, 30 or more degrees. And how that's going to help out, let's say you're sitting in a stoplight and it's August and it's hotter than blue blazes. When that car's just sitting there running, the floorboards seem like they're just on fire sometimes. But this stuff will make it a lot easier on you. We wanted to show you guys just how much of a difference using this coating on your car can make. So we've set up a simple test with a hot plate and we've coated one half of it with the lizard skin and left the other side bare. Okay, I'm going to take the infrared thermometer, put it on the untreated side. You can see the surface temperature is around 220, 225. And we'll take it over to here. And the temperature is all the way down to 195, 194, 193 right in that neighborhood. That's quite a difference, as promised. That was absolutely the best comparison we could ever have got. This thing isn't even melting yet at all. This thing just started moving like a slug, leaving a trail going across. Well, you can't ask for better performance than that out of a product. Did exactly what they said it would and delivered. So what do you think? Go put some in the car. The spray kit comes with a mixing wand, which you can attach to a standard drill to mix it thoroughly. Make sure this stuff is good and mixed up. A tip for pouring it into the gun. Pour it from several inches above the can, and that'll keep it wrangled and prevent a mess. This stuff is very easy to spray. You just want to make sure that the surface you're spraying it on is clean and oil free. You also want to avoid spraying over raw steel. So we've hit our floor with some Duplicolor Edge Primer where it was needed. Hold the gun about 10-12 inches from the surface, use a slight overlap, and you've got it made. Once we've given it about 24 hours to dry out, our floor is ready to think about interior components. Lizard skin also can be used to insulate against radiant sun heat under your headliner. Our headliner is in great shape though, it just needs cleaned, so we'll leave it alone. Alright, we've got our lizard skin applied to the floor of the 69 Copo Camaro. I want you guys to know that the one that we used in the white bucket is for heat control because of our big power plant, because of the big exhaust it's going to have, and because it's just basically a lightweight car and we're going to transfer a lot of it. Another product from Lizard Skin is the sound deadener. You can use both of them if you want to, but if you do you have to remember that the sound control goes on first and the thermal control goes on second. You'll want to apply them in that order so that they'll both do their job together once applied. Still ahead, saving your sheet metal from rust is way easier than you might think. All right, now that we've got our gearbox built with the help from Auto Gear, we're ready to mate it to our 427 to put this package together. We've decided to go with the OEM style clutch assembly, like the one we got from Hayes, which we know will work well because of their years of proven performance. We're also going to use the mechanical style linkage instead of the hydraulic, which is available. But this, more guys that are still in drag racing and more guys that are still into muscle cars prefer the feel of this mechanical linkage with their foot on that pedal. Hayes clutch kits come into three major styles of clutches and each kit comes with a pressure plate, throw out bearing, the disc assembly and the clutch alignment tool. And one thing that may interest you guys, Hayes clutch discs are made completely out of organic materials. We'll use the clutch alignment tool to, well, align the clutch. Then the pressure plate can go over top of it. When you tighten your pressure plate bolts down, make sure you follow the manufacturer's specs to get the correct amount of torque. If you can do this while the engine is out of the car, it's a whole lot easier than laying on your back under a car in the dark trying to do it uphill both ways. Hi, right, Tom, if you want to finish bolting this up, I'm going to take off, get some more parts. I'll be right back. Hurry up. He ain't going to hurry up. Some ARP assembly lubricant is recommended when you're using ARP bolts. And since we're putting these super strong bolts into an aluminum block, it's a must. There you go. We're one step closer to dropping this big bad dude off into our Copo. But you guys stick around. Mike's got something he'd like to show you. Just about every paint and body project we start on the power block begins with us stripping body panels down to bare metal. And for whatever reason we can't get to priming it or applying body filler right away, within hours surface rust can start to set in. 
One of the worst things that can cause corrosion is finger and hand prints. They will quickly turn into rust on an unprotected panel. You can prevent that by wiping down bare panels with WD-40, which will protect the surface until you're ready for the next step. There's no silicone in WD-40, so when you're ready for primer or filler, simply wipe the surface clean of WD-40 and continue on with the repair. You want to use a cleaning or paint prep solvent to remove it from the panel. Just a few sprays and wipe it away. It's imperative to remove the WD-40 before you paint and or do any body work to the surface. Then you're ready to move on. I know what you may have heard, but you can paint over panels that have been protected by WD-40. You just have to be sure to completely clean it before you do so. I know of several high-end shops that use WD-40 to protect their projects when they're in bare metal. Mink's gonna hit the door with a quick coat of Duplicolor as a demonstration, so that you can see that once the panel is wiped down, painting is no problem. It's a great way to save yourself from having to remove a bunch of rust from your body panels, and it's really affordable too. If you have any questions about anything you saw today, go to PowerBlockTV.com.